The Vampire Introduction The superstition upon which this tale is founded is very general in the East. Among the Arabians, it appears to be common. It did not, however, extend itself to the Greeks until after the embellishment of Christianity, and it has only assumed its present form since the division of the Latin and Greek churches, at which time the idea becoming prevalent that a Latin body could not corrupt if buried in their territory. It gradually increased and formed the subject of many wonderful stories, still extant, of the dead rising from their graves and feeding upon the blood of the young and beautiful. In the West it spread, with some slight variation, all over Hungary, Poland, Austria, and Lorraine, where the belief existed that vampires nightly imbibed a certain portion of the blood of their victims, who became emaciated, lost their strength, and speedily died of consumptions, whilst these human bloodsuckers fattened, and their veins became distended to such a state of repletion as to cause the blood to flow from all the passages of their bodies, and even from the very pores of their skins. In the London Journal of March 1732 is a curious and, of course, credible account of a particular case of vampirism, which is stated to have occurred at Madriga in Hungary. It appears that upon an examination of the commander-in-chief and magistrates of the place, they positively and unanimously affirmed that about five years before, a certain Hayduke named Arnold Paul had been heard to say that at Kasovia, on the frontiers of the Turkish Servia, he had been tormented by a vampire, but had found a way to rid himself of the evil by eating some of the earth out of the vampire's grave and rubbing himself with his blood. This precaution, however, did not prevent him from becoming a vampire himself. The universal belief is that a person sucked by a vampire becomes a vampire himself and sucks in his turn. For about twenty or thirty days after his death and burial, many persons complained of having been tormented by him, and a deposition was made that four persons had been deprived of life by his attacks. To prevent further mischief, the inhabitants, having consulted their Hadagni, chief bailiff, took up the body and found it, as is supposed to be usual in cases of vampirism, fresh and entirely free from corruption, and emitting from the mouth, nose, and ears pure and florid blood. Proof having been thus obtained, they resorted to the accustomed remedy. A stake was driven entirely through the heart and body of Arnold Paul, at which he is reported to have cried out as dreadfully as if he had been alive. This done, they cut off his head, burned his body, and threw the ashes into his grave. The same measures were adopted with the corpses of all those persons who had previously died from vampirism, lest they should, in their turn, become agents upon others who survived them. This monstrous rodomantade is here related because it seems better adapted to illustrate the subject of the present observations than any other instance which could be adduced. In many parts of Greece it is considered as a sort of punishment after death for some henuous crime committed whilst in existence, that the deceased is not only doomed to vampirize, but compelled to confine his infernal visitations solely to those beings he loved most while upon earth. Those to whom he was bound by ties of kindred and affection, a supposition alluded to in the Jaur, but first on earth as vampire sent. Thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt the native place and suck the blood of all thy race. There from thy daughter, sister, wife, at midnight drain the stream of life, yet loathe the banquet which perforce must feed thy livid living corpse. Thy victims, ere they yet expire, shall know the demon for their sire. As cursing thee, thou cursing them, thy flowers are withered on the stem but one that for thy crime must fall, the youngest, best, beloved of all, shall bless thee with a father's name, that word shall wrap thy heart in flame. Yet thou must end thy task and mark her cheek's last tinge, her eye's last spark, and the last glassy glance must view which breezes o'er its lifeless blue, then with unhallowed hand shall tear the tresses of her yellow hair.
of which in life a lock when shorn, affection's fondest pledge was worn, but now is borne away by thee, memorial of thine agony. Yet with thine own best blood shall drip thy gnashing tooth and haggard lip. Then stalking to thy sullen grave, go, and with ghouls and defreats rave, till these in horror shrink away from spectre more accursed than they. Mr. Southey has also introduced in his wild but beautiful poem Thalaba, the vampire corpse of the Arabian maid Oniza, who is represented as having returned from the grave for the purpose of tormenting him she best loved whilst in existence. But this cannot be supposed to have resulted from the sinfulness of her life, she being portrayed throughout the whole of the tale as a complete type of purity and innocence. The voracious Tornifore gives a long account in his travels of several astonishing cases of vampirism, to which he pretends to have been an eyewitness, and Calmet, in his great work upon the subject, besides a variety of anecdotes and traditionary narratives illustrative of its effects, has put forth some learned dissertations, tending to prove it to be a classical as well as a barbarian error. Many curious and interesting notices on this singularly horrible superstition might be added. Though the present may suffice for the limits of a note, necessarily devoted to explanation, and which may now be concluded by merely remarking that though the term vampire is the one in most general acceptation, there are several others synonymous with it, made use of in various parts of the world, such as rucolocha, vardulacha, ghoul, brucoloca, etc. The Vampire it happened that in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leaders of the town a nobleman, more remarkable for his singularities than his rank. He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently, the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention, that he might by a look quell it and throw fear into those breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Those who felt this sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the dead grey eye, which fixing upon the object's face did not seem to penetrate, and at one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to violent excitement and now felt the weight of ennui, were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters after notoriety attempted to win his attentions and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster shewn in drawing rooms since her marriage, threw herself in this way, and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice, though in vain. When she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unappalled impudence was baffled, and she left the field. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him, yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to the virtuous wife and innocent daughter, that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was that that it even overcame the dread of a singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, he was as often among those females who form the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues as among those who sully it by their vices. About the same time there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan left with an only sister in the possession of great wealth, by parents who died while he was yet in childhood, left also to himself by guardians who thought it their duty merely to take care of his fortune while they relinquished the more important charge of his mind to the care of mercenary subalterns, he cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. 
He had hence that high romantic feeling of honor and candor, which daily ruins so many milliners' apprentices. He believed all to sympathize with virtue, and thought that vice was thrown in by providence merely for the picturesque effect of the scene, as we see in romances. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes, which were as warm, but which were better adapted to the painter's eye by their irregular folds and various colored patches. He thought, in fine, that the dreams of poets were the realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon his entering into the gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving which should describe with least truth their languishing, romping favorites. The daughters, at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that, except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered, not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life for any of that conjuries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes, from which he had formed his study. Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. He watched him, and the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit assent to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact. Allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered its propensity to extravagant ideas, he soon formed this object into the hero of a romance and determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than that person before him. He became acquainted with him, paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognized. He gradually learnt that Lord Ruthven's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found from the notes of preparation in Blank Street that he was about to travel. Desirous of gaining some information respecting this singular character, who till now had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians that it was time for him to perform the tour which for many generations has been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged, and not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies, whenever scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subjects of pleasantry or of praise, according to the degree of skill shown in carrying them on. They consented, and Aubrey immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Ruthven was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it, and in a few days they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto, Aubrey had no opportunity of studying Lord Ruthven's character, and now he found that, though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the apparent motives to his conduct. His companion was profuse in his liberality. The idol, the vagabond, and the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous, reduced by indigence, by the misfortunes attendant upon every virtue, that he bestowed his alms. These were sent from the door with hardly suppressed sneers. But when the profligate came to ask something, not to relieve his want, but to allow him to wallow in his lust, or to sink him deeper in his iniquity, he was sent away with rich charity. This was, however, attributed by him to the greater importunity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indigent. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship, which was still more impressed upon his mind. All those upon whom it was bestowed inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and the most abject misery. At Brussels and other towns, through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companions sought for the centres of all fashionable vice. 
There he entered into all the spirit of the faro table. He betted and always gambled with success, except where the known sharper was his antagonist, and then he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash, youthful novice or the luckless father of a numerous family, then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractedness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of a cat whilst dallying with a half-dead mouse. In every town he left the formerly affluent youth torn from the circle he adorned, cursing in the solitude of a dungeon the fate that had drawn him within the reach of this fiend, whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute hungry children without a single farthing of his late immense wealth, wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy their present craving. Yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost to the ruiner of many, the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent. This might but be the result of certain degree of knowledge, which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend, and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all, and did not tend to his own profit. But he delayed it, for each day he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruth Venn, in his carriage and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eye spoke less than his lip, and though Aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he obtained no greater gratification from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery, which to his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. They soon arrived at Rome, and Aubrey for a time lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess, whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. Whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had before entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him sufficient reason for the belief. His guardians insisted upon his immediately leaving his friend and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious, for that the possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his licentiousness habits more dangerous to society. It had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character, but that he had required to enhance his gratification that his victim, the partner of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. In fine, that all those females whom he had sought, apparently on account of their virtue, had since his departure thrown even the mask aside and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. Aubrey determined upon leaving one, whose character had not yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye. He resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether, proposing in the meanwhile to watch him more closely, and let no slight circumstance pass by unnoticed. He entered into the same circle, and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavouring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented. In Italy, it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society. He was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret, but Aubrey's eyes followed him in all his windings, and soon discovered that an assassination had been appointed which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent, though thoughtless girl. Losing no time, he entered the apartment of Lord Ruthven and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time that he was aware of his being about to meet her that very night. Lord Ruthven answered that his intentions were such as he supposed all would have upon such an occasion, and upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her, merely laughed. Aubrey retired 
and immediately writing a note to say that from that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship in the remainder of their proposed tour. He ordered his servant to seek other apartments, and calling upon the mother of the lady, informed her of all he knew, not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. The assassination was prevented. Lord Ruthven next day merely sent his servant to notify his complete assent to a separation, but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by Aubrey's interposition. Having left Rome, Aubrey directed his steps towards Greece, and crossing the peninsula, soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that apparently, ashamed of chronicling the deeds of free men only before slaves, had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil or many colored lichens. Under the same roof as himself existed a being so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed the model for a painter wishing to portray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful in Mohammed's paradise, save that her eyes spoke too much mind for anyone to think she could belong to those who had no souls. As she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mountainside, one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties. For who would have exchanged her eye, apparently the eye of animated nature, for that sleepy, luxurious look of the animal suited but to the taste of an epicure? The light step of Ianthe often accompanied Aubrey in his search after antiquities, and often would the unconscious girl, engaged in the pursuit of a cashmere butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form, floating as it were upon the wind, to the eager gaze of him, who forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost defaced tablet in the contemplation of her sylph-like figure. Often would her tresses falling as she flittered around exhibit in the sun's ray such delicacy brilliant and swiftly fading hues. It might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary, who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of a passage of Pausanias. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel but none can appreciate? It was innocence, youth, and beauty, unaffected by crowded drawing rooms and stifling balls. While he drew those remains of which he wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil in tracing the scenes of her native place. She would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colors of youthful memory, the marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy, and then turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind, would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse. Her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of Aubrey, and often as she told him the tale of the living vampire, who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties, forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months. His blood would run cold, whilst he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies. But Ianthe cried to him the names of old men, who had at last detected one living among themselves after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. And when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them, with grief and heartbreaking, to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of Lord Ruthven. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though at the same time he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Ianthe. Her innocence, so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance, won his heart. And while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits, marrying an uneducated Greek girl, still he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her 
and forming a plan for some antiquarian research, he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained. But he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Ianthe was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank infantile being he had first known. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she had no longer anyone with whom she could visit her favorite haunts. Whilst her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time, she had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires. Then they both, with several present, affirmed their existence, pale with horror at the very name. Soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged of him not to return at night, as he must necessarily pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain, after the day had closed upon any consideration. They described it as the resort of the vampires in their nocturnal orgies, and denounced the most heavy evils as impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of their representations and tried to laugh them out of the idea. But when he saw them shudder at his daring thus to mock a superior, infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, he was silent. Next morning, Aubrey set off upon his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host and was concerned to find that his words mocked the belief of those horrible fiends had inspired them with such terror. When he was about to depart, Ianthe came to the side of his horse and earnestly begged of him to return ere night allowed the power of these beings to be put in action. He promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research that he did not perceive the daylight would soon end, and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay, but it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets, night begins, and dear he had advanced far, the power of the storm was above, its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick, heavy rain forced its way through the canopying foliage, whilst the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly his horse took fright, and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found by the glare of lightning that he was in the neighborhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself from the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled, exultant mockery of a laugh, continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled, but roused by the thunder which again rolled over his head, he, with a sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for, though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone, whom he immediately seized, when a voice cried, again baffled, to which a loud laugh succeeded and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled. But it was in vain. He was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, and kneeling upon his breast had placed his hands upon his throat. When the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him, he instantly rose, and leaving his prey rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches as he broke through the wood was no longer heard. The storm was now still, and Aubrey, incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered. The light of their torches fell upon the mud walls, and the thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. 
At the desire of Aubrey, they searched for her who had attracted him by her cries. He was again left in darkness. But what was his horror when the light of the torches once more burst upon him to perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless corpse? He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a vision arising from his disturbed imagination. But he again saw the same form when he unclosed them stretched by his side. There was no color upon her cheek, not even upon her lip. Yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of teeth having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying simultaneously, struck with horror. A vampire! A vampire! A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her who had been lately to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions, now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was benumbed and seemed to shun reflection and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger of particular construction, which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties who had been engaged in the search of her whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries as they approached the city forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they ascertained the cause of their child's death, they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the corpse. They were inconsolable. Both died broken-hearted. Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized with a most violent fever and was often delirious. In these intervals he would call upon Lord Ruthven and upon Ianthe. By some unaccountable combination he seemed to beg of his former companion to spare the being he loved. At other times he would imprecate maledictions upon his head and cursed him as her destroyer. Lord Ruthven glanced at this time to arrive in Athens, and from whatever motive upon hearing of the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled at the sight of him, whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. But Lord Ruthven, by his kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey. But as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired into the same state of mind, and Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him, during the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Ruthven was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cooling breeze, or in marking the progress of these orbs, circling, like our world, the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Aubrey's mind by this shock was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit which had once so distinguished him now seemed to have fled forever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Ruthven, but much as he wished for solitude his mind could not find it in the neighborhood of Athens. If he sought it amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ianthe's form stood by his side. If he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood, in quest of the modest violet then suddenly turning around would show to his wild imagination her pale face and wounded throat, with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly scenes, every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He proposed to Lord Ruthven, to whom he held himself bound by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece neither had yet seen. They traveled in every direction and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to slight these reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended dangers. 
In consequence of thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they traveled with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as a defense. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile at the bottom of which was the bed of a torrent with large masses of rock brought down from the neighboring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence, for scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant, their guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, had begun to fire in the direction whence the report came. Lord Ruthven and Aubrey, imitating their example, retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile. But ashamed of being thus detained by a foe, who with insulting shouts bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter, if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Ruthven received a shot in the shoulder, which brought him to the ground. Aubrey hastened to his assistance, and no longer heeding the contest of his own peril, was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him. His guards, having upon Lord Ruthven's being wounded, immediately thrown up their arms and surrendered. By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighboring cabin and having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence. They being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrade should return with the promised sum, for which he had an order. Lord Ruthven's strength rapidly decreased, and two days' mortification ensued, and the death seemed advancing with hasty steps. His conduct and appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects about him, but towards the close of the last evening his mind became apparently uneasy, and his eye fixed upon Aubrey, who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness. Assist me. You may save me. You may do more than that. I mean not my life. I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day. But you may save my honor, your friend's honor. How? Tell me how. I would do anything, replied Aubrey. I need but little. My life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole. But if you would conceal all you know of me, my honor were free from stain in the world's mouth. And if my death were unknown for some time in England, I, I, but life, it shall not be known. Swear, cried the dying man, raising himself with exultant violence. Swear by all your soul reveres, by all your nature's fears. Swear that for a year and a day you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen or whatever you may see. His eyes seemed bursting from their sockets. I swear, said Aubrey. He sunk laughing upon his pillow and breathed no more. Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with his man rose upon his mind, and he knew not why. When he remembered his oath, a cold shivering came over him, as if from the presentiment of something horrible awaiting him. Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse, when a robber met him and informed him that it was no longer there having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his retiring to the pinnacle of a neighboring mount, according to a promise they had given his lordship, that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death. Aubrey astonished, and taking several of the men, determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes though the robbers swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had laid the body. For a time his mind was bewildered in conjectures, but at last he returned, convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes. Weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes, and in which all apparently conspired to heighten that superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it, and soon arrived at Smyrna. While waiting for a vessel to convey him to Otranto or to Naples, he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to Lord Ruthven, 
Amongst other things, there was a case containing several weapons of offense, more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim. There were several daggers and otaguns. Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, what was his surprise at finding a sheath apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He shuddered. Hastening to gain further proof, he found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped, the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger. Yet still he wished to disbelieve. But the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and sheath, were alike in splendor on both, and left no room for doubt. There were also drops of blood on each. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome, his first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined, and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship. Aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors. He was afraid that this lady had fallen a victim to the destroyer of Ianthe. He became morose and silent, and his only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postilions, as if he were going to save the life of someone he held dear. He arrived at Calais, a breeze which seemed obedient to his will soon wafted him to the English shores, and he hastened to the mansion of his father's, and there, for a moment, appeared to lose, in the embraces and caresses of his sister, all memory of the past. If she before, by her infantine caresses, had gained his affection, now that the woman began to appear, she was still more attaching as a companion. Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing-room assemblies. There was none of that brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy charm about it which did not seem to arise from misfortune, but from some feeling within that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a brighter realm. Her step was not that light footing which strays wherever a butterfly or a color may attract. It was sedate and pensive. When alone, her face was never brightened by the smile of joy. But when her brother breathed to her his affection, and would in her present forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest. Who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary? It seemed as if those eyes, that face, were then playing in the light of their own native sphere. She was yet only eighteen, and had not been presented to the world, it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed until her brother's return from the continent, when he might be her protector, it was now, therefore, resolved that the next drawing-room, which was fast approaching, should be the epoch of her entry into the busy scene. Aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. He could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers, when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed, but he determined to sacrifice his own comfort to the protection of his sister. They soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day, which had been announced as a drawing-room. The crowd was excessive. A drawing-room had not been held for a long time, and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened thither. Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, heedless of all around him, engaged in the remembrance that the first time he had seen Lord Ruthven was in that very place, he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm, and a voice he recognized too well sounded in his ear. Remember your oath. He had hardly courage to turn, fearful of seeing a specter that would blast him, when he perceived at a little distance the same figure which had attracted his notice on this spot upon his first entry into society. He gazed till his limbs, almost refusing to bear their weight, he was obliged to take the arm of a friend, and forcing a passage through the crowd, he threw himself into his carriage and was driven home. He paced the room with hurried steps and fixed his hands upon his head as if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain. Lord Ruthven, again before him, circumstances started up in dreadful array, the dagger, 
his oath. He roused himself. He could not believe it possible. The dead rise again. He thought his imagination had conjured up the image his mind was resting upon. It was impossible that it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society. For though he attempted to ask concerning Lord Ruthven, the name hung upon his lips, and he could not succeed in gaining information. He went a few nights after with his sister to the assembly of a near relation, leaving her under the protection of a matron. He retired into a recess, and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself, and entering another room found his sister surrounded by several, apparently in earnest conversation. He attempted to pass and get near her, when one, whom he requested to move, turned around and revealed to him those features he most abhorred. He sprang forward, seized his sister's arm, and with hurried step forced her towards the street. At the door he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords, and while he was engaged in passing them, he again heard that voice whisper close to him, Remember your oath. He did not dare to turn, but hurrying his sister soon reached home. Aubrey became almost distracted. If before his mind had been absorbed by one subject, how much more completely was it engrossed, now that the certainty of the monsters living again pressed upon his thoughts? His sister's attentions were now unheeded, and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct. He only uttered a few words, and those terrified her. The more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this monster to roam, bearing ruin upon his breath, amidst all he held dear, and not avert its progress? His very sister might have been touched by him, but even if he were to break his oath and disclose his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch, but death, he remembered, had already been mocked. For days he remained in this state, shut up in his room, he saw no one, and ate only when his sister came, who with eyes streaming with tears besought him for her sake to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected, and he wandered, as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognized. At first he returned with the evening to the house, but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him. His sister, anxious for his safety, employed people to follow him, but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any, from thought. His conduct, however, suddenly changed. Struck with the idea that he left by his absence the whole of his friends, with a fiend amongst them, of whose presence they were unconscious, he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely, anxious to forewarn in spite of his oath all whom Lord Ruthven approached with intimacy. But when he entered into a room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward shudderings so visible, that his sister was at last obliged to beg of him to abstain from seeking, for her sake, a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remonstrance proved unavailing, the guardians thought proper to interpose, and fearing that his mind was becoming alienated, they thought it high time to resume again that trust which had been before imposed upon them by Aubrey's parents. Desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly, they engaged a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him. He hardly appeared to notice it, so completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber. There he would often lie for days, incapable of being roused. He had become emancipated. His eyes had attained a glassy luster. The only sign of affection and recollection remaining displayed itself upon the entry of his sister. Then he would sometimes start, and seizing her hands with looks that severely afflicted her, he would desire her not to touch him, 
Oh, do not touch him. If your love for me is aught, do not go near him. When, however, she inquired to whom he referred, his only answer was, True, true. And again he sank into a state, whence not even she could rouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as the year was passing, his incoherences became less frequent, and his mind threw off a portion of its gloom. Whilst his guardians observed that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number, and then smile. The time had nearly elapsed, when upon the last day of the year, one of his guardians entering his room began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstance of Aubrey's being in so awful a situation, when his sister was going next day to be married. Instantly, Aubrey's attention was attracted. He asked anxiously to whom? Glad of this mark of returning intellect, of which they feared he had been deprived, they mentioned the name of the Earl of Marsden. Thinking this was a young Earl whom he had met with in society, Aubrey seemed pleased, and astonished them still more by his expressing his intention to be present at the nuptials and desiring to see his sister. They answered not, but in a few minutes his sister was with him. He was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her lovely smile, for he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears, flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with all his want and warmth, and to congratulate her upon her marriage with a person so distinguished for rank and every accomplishment. When he suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast, opening it, what was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life? He seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it underfoot. Upon her asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband, he looked as if he did not understand her. Then seizing her hands and gazing on her with a frantic expression of countenance, he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster, for he... But he could not advance... It seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath. He turned suddenly around, thinking Lord Ruthven was near him, but saw no one. In the meantime, the guardians and physicians, who had heard the whole and thought this was but a return of his disorder, entered and forcing him from Miss Aubrey, desiring her to leave him. He fell upon his knees to them. He implored, he begged of them to delay but for one day. They, attributing this to the insanity they imagined had taken possession of his mind, endeavored to pacify him, and retired. Lord Ruthven had called the morning after the drawing-room and had been refused with everyone else. When he heard of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself to be the cause of it, but when he learned that he was deemed insane, his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information. He hastened to the house of his former companion, and by constant attendance, and the pretense of great affection for the brother and interest in his fate, he gradually won the ear of Miss Aubrey. Who could resist his power? His tongue had dangers and toils to recount, could speak of himself as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth, save with her to whom he addressed himself could tell how, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation, if it were merely that he might listen to her soothing accents. In fine, he knew so well how to use the serpent's art, for such was the will of fate that he gained her affections. The title of the elder branch falling at length to him, he obtained an important embassy, which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey, when he was left by the physician and his guardians, attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for pen and paper. It was given him. He wrote a letter to his sister, conjuring her as she valued her own happiness, her own honor, and the honor of those now in the grave, who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house to delay but for a few hours that marriage, on which he denounced the most heavy curses. The servants promised they would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of Miss Aubrey by what he considered the ravings of a maniac.'
Night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described the notes of busy preparation. Morning came, and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear. Aubrey grew almost frantic. The curiosity of the servants at last overcame their vigilance. They gradually stole away, leaving him in the custody of a helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity. With one bound was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment where all were nearly assembled. Lord Ruthven was the first to perceive him. He immediately approached, and taking his arm by force hurried him from the room, speechless with rage. When on the staircase Lord Ruthven whispered in his ear, Remember your oath, and know, if not my bride today your sister is dishonored. Women are frail. So saying, he pushed him towards his attendants, who, roused by the old woman, had come in search of him. Aubrey could no longer support himself. His rage, not finding vent, had broken a blood vessel, and he was conveyed to bed. This was not mentioned to his sister, who was not present when he entered, as the physician was afraid of agitating her. The marriage was solemnized, and the bride and bridegroom left London. Aubrey's weakness increased. The effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death. He desired his sister's guardians might be called, and when the midnight hour had struck he related composedly what the reader had perused. He died immediately after. The guardians hastened to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived it was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. The End